So welcome to the first talk in 2023 of Holotube. Uh, so we are back and the first speaker is Christoph Ullemann from University of Oxford. And he will um, report on recent progress in double holography and the page curve in type 2B string theory. So we are re really looking forward to your talk. Thanks for agreeing to give it. And um, so the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation um, to give a talk here. It's great to see some familiar faces um, and names in the participant list. So my talk today is um, about double holography, black holes, and page curves. And the broad theme will be to take discussions which have happened in the context of bottom-up models and uplift them to string theory to make them um, precise and address some puzzles which um, appeared along the way. So in a little more detail, the broad context for my talk is the extensive um, recent research activity regarding the information problem for black holes in ADS, which are coupled to a bath. So if you just put a black hole in ADS, shown as this little box on the upper right part of the slide, it won't evaporate. But one way to make that happen is to couple the whole system to a bath into which the black hole can dump its Hawking radiation. Now for the black holes I will be talking about, um, they are exclusively eternal black holes, which won't evaporate either. But this bath will still play an important role as a place to collect the Hawking radiation and analyze its features. Now, the thing we learned is that when we calculate um, fine-grained or for Neumann entropies uh, in gravitating systems, there are new contributions to the entanglement entropy calculations, uh, which can be understood as certain replica wormhole contributions uh, to the gravitational path integral when we calculate uh, entanglement entropies using the replica tree. Now, their contributions can be um, captured in a neat extremization principle where we have um, a semi-classical quantum field theory entropy, that would be Hawking's calculation. Um, but it is generalized in the sense that we allow for contributions from potentially disconnected regions of space-time, denoted by I here. These new contributions get penalized by an area term, but increasing the region we're looking at can reduce this quantum field theory entropy in the second term, so that these new contributions can really become favorable and lead to large corrections to the entropy calculations. And based on these um, new insights, um, it has been demonstrated uh, that at least for certain black holes, uh, the entropy of the Hawking radiation follows page curves and is consistent with unitarity in that way. Um, the models include two-dimensional um, models, uh, primarily JT gravity, and in higher dimensions, um, primarily brain world models, where the notion of double holography really makes the calculations tractable. We we'll talk about this in more detail along the way. Um, one point one may want to keep in mind is that to the extent that gravitons exist in these models, meaning not too low in dimension, uh, these gravitons are massive. Um, and just how much, uh, how, how important that is for the physics is a bit a matter of debate. But for the time being, we have concrete models which have versions of the information paradox, and we seem to know how to resolve it. So we are to understand these models as best we can. And that brings me to the motivation for my talk here. So the basic motivation is that what I've reviewed so far is all really a great story. Um, but if I have a wish list, I would want four dimensional black holes in UV complete theories of quantum gravity, meaning embedded in string theory. And where to the extent that we use ADS CFT, uh, we have top down constructions with concrete quantum field theory duals, which are defined microscopically. For example, in the sense that they have no inherent averaging in the same way that N equals four super young mills um, is a concrete theory where we know the parameters and we know how ADS CFT works for this theory. Um, and the sort of main aim is that having such a precise definition will allow us to address some puzzles and also opens new uh, connections to other research programs like um, microstate counting for supersymmetric black holes and those kinds of directions. As a rough outline for the talk, um, I have four parts. The first one is introductory. Uh, I want to review a little bit the brain world story, um, explain the notion of double holography uh, as a way to build up intuition for the later parts, and also to point out a puzzle which has uh, arisen in these models, which um, threatens a little bit to rain on the parade. 
Uh, the main part then will be about um, string theory versions of the discussion. We first talk about how to uplift the discussion, the, these brain world models to string theory, talk about islands and page curves. And in the last part, we want to make this notion of double holography, which I'll explain um, precise in the string theory context and address this puzzle from the first part. Um, I should say that what I'll talk about is based by now on a few papers. Um, the first black hole paper is by now a year and a half old. Uh, there was some very nice groundwork with Lorenzo Caccia, where we connected these string theory setups. Um, I will talk about the supersymmetric localization calculations, and that really helps with the interpretation. And then the latest model with uh, Andreas Karsch and Hayu Sim is all about uh, fleshing out this notion of double holography in string theory. All right, but let's start at the beginning, uh, brain world models and double holography. So the models which are relevant for the black hole and page, uh, the brain world models which are relevant for the black hole and page curve discussions um, arise as bottom-up holographic duals for boundary CFTs, meaning a CFT placed on a space time with a boundary like a half space in such a way that some conformal symmetry uh, is uh, preserved. So concretely, we're looking at a four-dimensional BCFT on a half space, uh, which the boundary of this half space is coupled to some three-dimensional degrees of freedom. And such holographic duals can be um, constructed as a variant of Randall's syndrome brain worlds, uh, which were first um, discussed by Karsh and Randall. Um, and the idea is we start with a 5D Einstein-Hilbert action and add to it um, a, just a thin brain with tension. And if we choose this tension, uh, uh, below the critical value which arises in the Randall syndrome models, uh, we can find a solution which is sort of just an empty ADS5, uh, or rather a part of ADS5, which is chopped off by the brain we added, uh, which acts as an end of the world brain. So in the cartoon here, we have ADS5, uh, let's say the Poincare patch represented with the horizontal line on the top representing the conformal boundary. And we have the brain extending along this thick um, line at an angle, some particular angle theta star. Um, it extends along an ADS4 slice in this ADS5, and it terminates the ADS5 part we're looking at. So instead of having a complete flat space as a conformal boundary, since this brain intersects the conformal boundary, we only retain a half space of it. And so naturally, um, the quantum field theory dual for this is a CFT on a half space. Um, the brain angle theta star here is dictated by the brain tension uh, and encodes in some way uh, how many defect degrees of freedom we have on this three-dimensional locus where the brain intersects the conformal boundary. Um, so the, um, it measures in some sense how many 3D degrees of freedom we have compared to the number of 40 degrees of freedom. All right, now the crucial point about these models is that in addition to the two um, descriptions we've already discussed, the field theory description as a CFT on a half space coupled to some three dimensional degrees of freedom and the five dimensional description as gravity with an end of the world brain, uh, these models are supposed to have an additional layer of holographic description, which is kind of intermediate between the two. And this intermediate layer supposedly takes the form of a gravity theory on the end of the world brain, which is coupled through some sort of transparent boundary condition uh, to the remaining ambient four-dimensional CFT degrees of freedom. Um, this intermediate description has its origin uh, in the holographic uh, interpretation of randall syndrome models. One may think of the gravity theory on the brain as ge geometrizing in some way the defect degrees of freedom. Um, so we will make this notion more precise later on, but for the time being, I just want to take it as face value and notice that this is precisely the setup we are talking about for these black hole discussions. We have a gravity theory on ADS, which is coupled to a bath, which is a non-gravitational CFT. So this is the, uh, the, the description we really care for, but it will be useful to have all three of these descriptions um, when we talk about calculating page curves and studying black holes. All right, so let's take a look at how this plays out in a little more detail. 
Um, the black holes we will consider um, will all be eternal black holes. So let me first review what the page curve looks like uh, for eternal black holes coupled to a bar. So the idea here is we want to look at um, an eternal ADS black hole shown as the shaded region, which is in equilibrium with the bath um, to which it is coupled. So both exterior regions are coupled to a quantum field theory bath with which they are in equilibrium. Um, and the bath is represented by the outer triangles in this figure here. Um, the idea then is to prepare the system at the central time slice in a pure state, for example, by connecting to a Euclidean version of the geometry, and then time evolve forward in both of the exterior regions. So what we're going to do is we pick a radiation region in the bath, shown as the blue line here, symmetrically on both sides, and we just track the entropy that we collect in this region. Initially, um, this extrema, in this extremization principle, there's no contribution from the island terms, and we just find a growing entropy, which increases the more Hawking radiation we collect. Now, if the Hawking radiation were truly thermal, this growth would just keep on going as we have a set, set up where we uh, constantly exchange radiation between the black hole and the bath, and the more Hawking radiation we collect, the more entropy we should find until eventually the radiation entropy would exceed the black hole entropy. And that's where we would run into problems with, um, with basic principles like unitarity. Um, and this is the information paradox for eternal black holes. The claim though is that at later times, it becomes beneficial in this extremization principle to include an island contribution shown in red here. And once this uh, contribution becomes important, the evolution of the entropy changes and it actually saturates. So this is the notion of a page curve for these eternal black holes. The entropy doesn't go back down because the black hole doesn't evaporate, um, but instead it saturates. And this is a very schematic cartoon. The idea now is to make this a little more concrete uh, in the context of brain world models. So if you want to study uh, black holes, we first have to get black holes into the picture. And one very convenient way to do this is to take the ADS5 metric and write it in an ADS4 slicing. So in the picture here, all the radial lines represent ADS4 slices. We see that the end of, end of the world brain extends along one of them. And now a convenient way to introduce black holes into the setup is to replace these ADS4 slices by eternal ADS4 black holes. This still solves Einstein's equations. And what we get is a horizon which extends along this dashed line. We get a black hole on the brain, just as we wanted to, um, and the field theory bath we're looking at is now also defined on a non-gravitating fixed black hole background at the same temperature. Uh, the two systems exchange radiation and the black hole doesn't evaporate, just as we described in the previous slide. And the idea now is to, in analogy with what we discussed, to pick a radiation region somewhere in the bath, let's say this blue region R, and calculate the uh, entropy, the entanglement entropy associated with that region, the Neumann entropy. Um, and this is really a question which we have about this intermediate holographic picture. So this is where we do the physical interpretation. But the benefit of having this full 5D picture is that we can now calculate this entropy using just standard three Tucker and Ivy surfaces. Everything's geometrized in the 5D bulk. And so we just do a standard RT, the standard RT prescription. And we find that the entropy is determined by the competition between two types of minimal surfaces. The first one stretches from the boundary of the radiation region through the horizon, through the ER bridge connecting to the second exterior region, uh, and connects to the mirror copy of this region R in the second exterior region. This surface has to cross the horizon and the ER bridge, and therefore its area grows in time. So this is the part which gives us the growing entropy here. If that were the only one, we'd be in trouble, but fortunately there is a second surface which connects um, from the radiation region over to the end of the world brain. It singles out a particular region on this end of the world brain denoted I here. Um, and since this surface stays entirely uh, on one side of the horizon, its area does not grow and is instead constant. So this is the surface which eventually limits the entropy growth and leads to the uh, saturated part of the page curve. This red region I here really is an island from the perspective of the intermediate holographic description where we have gravity on the brain coupled to the ambient CFT. It's a disconnected region in space from that perspective which contributes to the entropy. 
so this is a really nice story. Um, we found uh, a page curve from the competition between these two types of um, uh, RT surfaces. And we could do this just without evaluating this more complicated extremization principle explicitly uh, by taking the detour through this, uh, these three layers, this triality of holographic descriptions for the setup. There are a couple of questions one could ask here. What exactly is the conformal field theory? What exactly is the nature of the coupling between the gravitational theory and the bath? Uh, what is the precise dictionary between these three holographic layers? And these are all good questions. And addressing them actually becomes somewhat urgent um, um, once we notice that there are some uh, fairly more pressing puzzles with this setup. And that's what I want to discuss in the remaining part of this sort of introduction. So a more pressing puzzle with this, with this kind of setup. Um, the puzzle was pointed out somewhat recently and has nothing to do with brain with uh, black holes. So we can just go back to MTADS, and we recall that the intermediate holographic description was supposed to be gravity on the brain coupled to um, a bath here. And now the puzzle due to Omiya and Wei arises if you imagine yourself living in the gravitational part of this setup from the intermediate um, description, and you want to send a signal over to your friend at U1 who's sitting in the bath. Um, there are two ways to do that. One way is to just shoot a, geodes a null geodesic through the bulk such that it arrives at your friend U1 after some certain amount of time. And there is a second way to do that, which is you can work within the intermediate picture. You can send an null geodesic along the brain uh, to the point where it connects to the bath and then through the bath geometry uh, back to your friend. And now if these, um, if these different layers of holographic description were truly equivalent, uh, you would certainly want their causal structures to agree. The two pictures should agree on whether two points are causally connected or not. That means the times these two geodesics take should agree. Uh, and what you find instead, though, is that there's actually a time discrepancy between these two uh, ways of sending signals. The bulk geodesic is generically faster, and how much time you save actually increases the further these points are separated. Um, so this is a fairly substantial um, discrepancy here. It vanishes only in the limit where the brain angle becomes sharp, where the sort of end of the world brain approaches the conformal boundary. In that limit, these two times agree, and then it becomes the statement that in usual ADS CFT, the causal structures between the CFT and the ADS description are compatible. But for any finite brain angle, um, there is this discrepancy between these times. And so if you wanted to hold on to this intermediate picture, you would have to accept that it has some fairly dramatic non-localities to it. And this is a little bit, um, um, of a problem, we have non-localities to begin with. This, this threatens um, to, to rain a little bit on the on the page curve parade. And that brings me then to the to the main part of the talk, um, where I really want to talk about how to uplift this discussion to string theory to make it sharp and precise. Uh, the motivation is twofold. The first is that these Randall syndrome brains are not part of string theory; they're bottom-up models. Um, um, and the question is whether the story holds up once you go to a, a full string theory setting. And the second point is what I um, highlighted, that the intermediate picture uh, has some questions which would be nice to understand better. Uh, and it has these seemingly dramatic non-localities, which one wants to sort out whether these are important or not, whether they threaten the relevance of these page curves or not. And the wish list, wish list items we're going to check off um, are number one, we're going to find uh, page curves for four dimensional black holes in a full string theory setting, and then give a top down um, construction for a local intermediate picture in the spirit of double, double holography. All right, let's talk about uplifting um, these brain world models to string theory. The starting point in the brain world discussion was a four dimensional BCFT. And so the first thing we need to find as a starting point for a string theory discussion uh, is some concrete set of BCFTs which we can engineer in string theory. Now our favorite um, holographic theory um, in four dimensions is of course N equals four super young mills engineered by D3 brains. 
And the theory can indeed be put on a half space in a way which preserves supersymmetry and some part of the conformal symmetry. Uh, in string theory terms, we're looking at D3 brains ending on D5 and NS5 brains. This is a, a large space of theories. There are many ways to terminate D3 brains on five brains. This has been worked out uh, in great detail um, by Gayato and Witten and uh, Hanani and Witten. Um, I don't want to go through the full sort of general story here. What I instead want to show you is a kind of minimal setup, which for my purposes is just rich enough to do the things that I want to do here. So the setup is characterized by two integers, n and k, and we have some number 2nk of semi-infinite D3 brains. So those guys extend all the way out to infinity. Uh, and they engineer 40n equals 4 super young moves with a gauge group u2nk. And these D3 brains are then terminated on a sandwich of n D5 brains and n NS5 brains, um, where all of the D5 brains have the same number of D3 brains ending on them. And likewise, all of the NS5 brains have the same number of D3 brains ending on them. Uh, these numbers are de also determined by n and k. Um, we don't need in all detail um, how this works, but the point is that the sandwich of D5 and NS5 brains uh, and how the D3 brains end on them encodes what the three-dimensional defect degrees of freedom are. Now, this is not excessively transparent in this rep representation of the brain cartoon. To make it more transparent, we can um, use hanani witten uh, transitions to give an equivalent representation of this brain cartoon. So we have our semi-infinity three brains sticking out, and then we have all the NS5 brains shown as vertical lines, um, separated out a little bit, and Within each pair, we have a stack of finite extent D3 brains. So each of these stacks corresponds to a three-dimensional gauge node. So what we have is a three-dimensional quiver theory um, where um, first on, on the one end, we have the rank is slightly larger than that of the 40N equals four gauge theory. Then the rank increases since the number of D3 brains increase up to a node, which is sort of maximal rank, and that node has flavors attached to it represented by the D5 brains, then the rank goes back down to zero. So the details of this won't be what matters in the following, but what is important is that for each N and K, we have a very concrete field theory understanding of what the three-dimensional defect degrees of freedom are as encoded in this big D5 NS5 sandwich here. And the reason why these, this, this brain construction is a great starting point for uplifting these brain world models is that we know how to construct the holographic duals for these field theories. We know what the back reaction of, these, uh, of this more complicated brain uh, diagram produces. This has been worked out uh, in, uh, in, in uh, its general form by Eric Doka, John Estes, and uh, Michael Good parallel. Um, the geometry has an ADS4 factor representing the defect conformal symmetry and two spheres representing the R symmetry that's um, preserved by this construction. And if you count four and two spheres gives eight, so there are two dimensions left. The whole geometry is a warp product of ADS4 and the two spheres over some Riemann surface signal. Where these warp factors here depend on the location on sigma and there are fluxes and things which we won't spell out in detail. The point is, depending on what the choice of this Riemann surface is, uh, these kinds of solutions allow us to engineer um, holographic duals for a large space of field theories, including in particular the 40 BCFTs I was talking about, and also genuine three dimensional superconformal field theories, which we'll put to good use later. So, for the particular brain construction I have given on the previous slide, we can just picture of this solution in a, um, in a suggestive way here. We won't need any of the details. So this strip is a, the, the Riemann surface is an infinite strip uh, where on each point of the strip, we have an ADS4 and the two spheres attached in such a way that on the upper and lower boundaries on each of them, one of the spheres collapses. So the geometry closes off smoothly. And likewise, on the left end of the strip, the geometry completely closes off smoothly. There are no end of the world brains uh, just a smooth sort of internal space. On the right end, the solution sort of the geometry blows up to become ADS5 cos S5, just in line with these two NK uh, D3 brains. And on the upper and lower 
boundaries of the strip, we have two distinguished points where the NS5 and D5 brains in the brain construction emerge. So this is sort of the extent to which we will need the solution. So we will look at the solutions here. Um, and this is our, our sort of playground to generalize or to study uh, stringy brain models. Um, so if we compare these handy geometries or the sketch of these handy geometries as I've given it now uh, to the brain world models, they are certainly um, take a more complicated form, but we can actually describe them in a way which is very similar to the brain world models. And this will help build some intuition. So in the brain world model shown on the right here, we had this end of the world brain, and this is resolved in the 10D solution into a big chunk of geometry and fluxes. All the region around the five brain sources shown in this yellowish color here um, is the 10D resolution of this um, effective end of the world brain. And the remaining ADS5 cross S5 part sort of which emerges asymptotically on the right end of the strip corresponds to going towards the conformal boundary uh, in, in, the, in the 5D model on the right. Um, the vertical direction which we have on the strip is one of the angular coordinates on S5. So that is certainly not visible in the bottom-up model because we just worked in 5D, but everything gets its proper interpretation. That's the point. Now to push a bit on these analogies, when we compare the two pictures, in the brain world model, we had the ADS4 radial coordinate extending along these radial lines when we write ADS5 and ADS4 slicing. On the left, we haven't really included the um, radial coordinate yet. Uh, we have at every point of this trip an ADS4 sitting. And so to make the pictures more similar, we should include the radial coordinate. Uh, that gives us this box type of picture where the um, upper bound, the top sort of um, boundary of the box is the conformal boundary of this whole geometry. And the ADS4 radial coordinate extends vertically towards the bottom. So now really, we really have sort of um, um, these two pictures on a similar footing. Uh, in the, on the right, all the ADS4 slices join at one point, and we should in a similar way think of the upper uh, boundary of this box as sort of representing one point in the geometry. But we leave it in the form in which it is now. Uh, an important and point which was important, of course, for the black hole discussion was where's the bath? What is the ambient CFT? The, um, 4 dB CFT that was living at the remaining part of the conformal boundary here. And that corresponds in this box picture now to the entire plane on the right end of this um, strip combined with the ADS4 radial coordinate. We we'll talk about the Im intermediate picture uh, and how that comes about later. For the time being, we'll um, just assume that it exists, uh, work with it, um, that there is a way to make it precise and focus on this full dual for the entire BCFT, which we constructed with this brain cartoon of D3 brains ending on D5 and NS5 brains. Now, before going to black holes, um, the last part that I want to discuss here is give some uh, relation between the parameters in the brain work models and the 10D uh, solutions. We can ask whether there is a representation in particular for the brain angle in the brain work model. Um, as I tried to um, point out, the brain angle encodes in some way the ratio of 3D and 4D central charges, how many degrees of freedom, how many 3D degrees of freedom compared to how many 4D degrees of freedom. Um, and in the 10D solutions, in the 10D constructions, we have concrete field theory duals with concrete three-dimensional quiver CFTs and 4D gauge theories. So we can just compute what these central charges are. Um, this is something, uh, this was work with uh, Lorenzo Caccia, where we looked at very generic three-dimensional long quivers of the form uh, that appears in these solutions and calculated the free energies. I don't want to go through the details here. Instead, I'll take a shortcut, which will give us the correct picture. So the shortcut is we have our BCFT, where we have uh, semi-infinity three brains, and we have our D5 and NS5 brains. And we can, in a crude way, produce a three-dimensional theory from that by just setting k to zero. Then the semi-infinity three brains all disappear, and we are left with the sandwich of D5 and NS5 brains. For this particular theory, the free energy is given by some numerical factor, has a zeta of three in there. 
And then crucially, it scales with n to the four. So if we were to compute this, to compare um, this free energy as a stand-in for the central charge to the four-dimensional um, central charge of n equals four super young mills with gauge group U2 and K, then the 4D central charge goes as n squared k squared, while this goes as n to the four. So clearly we would conclude that the ratio n over k is setting the ratio of the central charges. To properly isolate the defect degrees of freedom in the sandwich takes a bit more work and I won't get into it. But the point is the ratio n over k is the 10D analog of the brain angle um, in the bottom up models. And we'll see that this uh, interpretation will be confirmed uh, down the road. The last part on this slide I want to um, point out here is that this sort of brain angle actually has a geometric interpretation in the 10D solutions. So in the bottom up models, the brain angle just tells me how much of ADS5 am I chopping off and how much do I keep? So this is very geometric. And likewise, there is a similar picture in the 10D solutions. Um, by studying Wilson loops um, in, in, in these sort of BCFTs we're looking at here, using on the one hand brain constructions and string theory and supergravity, and by linking the pictures using localization calculations, we can define a set of coordinates on the strip which have a clear meaning in the brain construction and field theory. So in this picture, the vertical kinds of curves each correspond to one 3D gauge node. And we see that this set of coordinates covers one part of the strip, not the entire strip. And this part shrinks and grows as we dial n over k. So on the one hand, there is a geometric representation for this 10D brain angle, and these coordinates will come back later as being useful. All right, but this shall, shall be it for, for sort of hopefully giving um, some um, um, sketch of how to uplift these brain work models to string theory and hopefully some intuition for how to look at the 10D solutions. And the task now is to sort of bring black holes into the game and uh, talk about page curves. So again, to study black holes, we first have to bring in black holes. Uh, and that can be done in a very analogous fashion to what we did in the brain work model. Actually. We have these ADS4 fibers at each point of the strip. And we just replace all of them with an eternal radius for a black hole. This still solves the type 2b equations of motion. It's a non supersymmetric solution, but that's the uh, name of the game here. Um, and in terms of our box representation for the 10D solution, we now have the ADS4 radial coordinate not extending downwards indefinitely, but instead we have a horizon at some finite value of the radial coordinate, which is shown as this white noise kind of picture here. Um, very much in parallel with the previous discussion, we then go to our bath, which we agreed was on the right end of the strip, and we fix a radiation region in this bath. And the analog of what we did in the brain world model would be to take this shaded region on the right end of the strip here and pick, pick that as our radiation region. So this is uplifting basically uh, the discussion I've given initially to this 10D setup. And we then have our work basically cut out for us. We need to calculate this entropy using the Takayanagi surfaces. Uh, instead of the little curves I've shown on the initial slides, we now have eight dimensional RT surfaces and the 10 dimensional geometry. They are supposed to be anchored on the boundary of this radiation region. Um, they wrap both of the spheres and they then extend from this boundary of the radiation region into the interior of the strip. So if you want to actually find them, we have to, they are, they are sort of characterized by a PDE on sigma, uh, and we have to sort out what the boundary conditions are at the boundaries of the strip. This can all be done, follows from regularity of having a smoothly collapsing minimal surface on the boundaries of this uh, strip. And that basically specifies the problem. So we have a fairly nasty PDE with singular points because we have the five brain sources in the geometry. There's no help from supersymmetry, so this clearly is a task for numerics, and I won't get into any of the details and instead just show you pictures. So again, we find two classes of surfaces. The first are surfaces which uh, drop into the horizon before ever reaching this resolved end of the world brain region. 
they have to go uh, into the second exterior region of the ADS4 black hole, so their area grows in time. The two surfaces shown here are just for different sizes of the radiation region. You can see that the surfaces notice a little bit the brain sources here start to bulge out. Uh, but qualitatively, they have the same form, and they give us the growing part of the entropy curve. Again, if these were the only ones, we'd be in trouble, but fortunately, we can find another type of surface as well. The island surfaces now um, do not drop into the horizon, but instead stretch all the way through the strip and terminate on the left end of the strip. They stay entirely on one side of the horizon and therefore have a constant area. You see these little dips here where they notice the presence of the five brain sources. Um, one can calculate, one can determine the behavior near the five brain so, uh, sources analytically, and the surfaces, the numerics reproduces this behavior. So this is a good consistency check. And we really have these two surfaces, and this is basically part one of the, of the mission. Um, we have 10 versions of the um, surfaces stretching through the horizon, of the island surfaces, and their competition gives us um, uh, page curves. To show that one can make this a little more concrete, um, quantitatively assess the, uh, the, the shape of the entropy curves. Since we have two surfaces, we can have two scenarios. The first one is that the surface stretching through the horizon, these guys, uh, dominate initially, then grow until eventually the island surfaces take over. That's the first scenario and gives us the non-trivial page curve as we had on the slide. The second scenario is that the island surface just dominates right away. Uh, in that case, the um, surfaces stretching through the horizon never play a role for the entropy, and we just get a flat entropy curve. That may not look as interesting, but they're both compatible with unitarity, and this has to do with how much of the initial entropy between uh, the radiation region and the complement we capture here. One can then map out sort of a phase diagram for where one gets a page curve and where one gets a constant entropy. Uh, I won't discuss this in detail, just say that intuitively speaking, if the radiation is connect collected far enough in the bath region, we get a non-trivial page curve. And these results are qualitatively consistent with uh, discussion in uh, the bottom-up models, which actually appeared um, a little later. So these two pictures are, are very much consistent and sort of um, uh, in line with each other. So to sum up that part, we have these page curves for four-dimensional black holes in string theory. Uh, the results in this minimal 10-dimensional model, which I engineered for you, validate the brain world discussions and, and support them. But there's a vast space of 10D solutions to explore, many knobs and dials to play with in terms of what the 3D defect degrees of freedom are, and all this is very precise. Um, the attendee setups are certainly more complicated, but the advantage is that they're microscopically well defined. This gives us access to new questions and in particular shines when we start to address um, puzzles which have come about in the bottom-up models. And that will be um, the last part for the remaining minutes where I want to tell you um, how to make this notion of double holography sharp and address the, the puzzle with the incompatible causal structures, which we had in the bottom-up model. All right, so just to recall, in the brain world models, we had the problem that we have two geodesics, one through the bulk, one along the brain, and the one through the bulk was generically faster, providing sort of a causal shortcuts through the bulk. If we were to insist on our intermediate picture as being gravity on the brain coupled to a bath field. Now, the first question you may ask is, maybe this problem just goes away automatically when we switch to these more complicated 10D solutions. Um, maybe they just somehow don't see this problem to begin with, and we can hold on to a 10D version of this intermediate picture. So let's say our intermediate picture were given by taking the resolved 10-dimensional end of the world brain, so the region of the geometry around the five brain sources, and perhaps this is what we can use as gravity theory for our intermediate picture. Then we would say to test whether this puzzle persists, we pick a point on the 10 dimensional end of the world brain shown on the left here and another point in the bath shown on the right here. And then we can ask the same question. There are again, two ways to shoot geodesics. One is sort of through the bulk. This is just a schematic representation here. 
And the other one is the analog of going along the brain that would be shooting straight up here and then straight back down in the bar. And what you find is that this naive picture is just no good in 10D either. Um, the bulk geodesics generically are again faster than the geodesics along the brain. And they have actually a very similar uh, dependence on the separation between these points as we found in the bottom up models. So the brain world models got that's very much right. Um, this naive intermediate description is just also no good in 10D. The only limit where these two geodetics agree is when this ratio n over k, which we had in the brain construction in 10D, goes to infinity. And that precisely corresponds to the critical limit in the, in the brain world model. Um, so these, these things are very much analogous. And this somehow we have to work harder and this naive tender dimensional description is just not what we should do. But then again, from a 10D perspective, this sort of way to engineer an intermediate description also doesn't seem very natural. It doesn't seem natural to just chop off the 10D ge geometry somewhere and declare that gravity in this remaining region would be, would be what enters in the intermediate picture. What we should do instead is really make the idea behind double holography precise. And since we have a microscopic model here, we can actually do that. So the idea is to start with our BCFT, which we can look at as a combination of three-dimensional and four-dimensional degrees of freedom. And what we've discussed so far is geometrizing the entire BCFT. That was the 10-dimensional duals we looked at, the full BCFT dual. To get to the intermediate picture, we should instead isolate the three-dimensional degrees of freedom out of this um, combined BCFT and geometrize only the three-dimensional degrees of freedom. If we can do that, then these three-dimensional degrees of freedom are dual to some ADS4 gravity theory. And that ADS4 gravity theory then is naturally coupled to the remaining 40 ambient uh, CFT degrees of freedom since the three defect degrees of freedom were coupled. And so the name of the game is clear. We should use our brain construction and then just apply first principles ADS CFT to derive a proper intermediate description. So here's how I would propose to do that. Um, we had our brain cartoon with the semi-infinity three brains and the sandwich of D5 and NS5 brains. And what we want to do is we want to do away with these D3 brains here, the semi-infinity three brains. We want to uh, eliminate them so that we isolate the three-dimensional degrees of freedom. And the way to do that is to terminate each of the D3 brains on a D5 brain. Each gets its own, um, own D5 brain to end on. And what this means in field theory terms is we first had a three-dimensional quiver with increasing rank, then there was a node with flavor attached, then the rank decreased, and then eventually we had our four-dimensional gauge node on the half space, which is designated by a hat here. What I'm showing in the brain cartoon here will replace this four-dimensional gauge node on a half space by just flavor degrees of freedom. So we now get a genuine three-dimensional quiver CFD. And introducing these flavor degrees of freedom comes along with an SU2NK flavor symmetry associated with these flavors. And that allows us to make very precise now how to go back from this three-dimensional um, quiver to the full BCFT. That is what tells us how the coupling works between the bath and the defect field. What we should do is we should gauge this SU2NK global flavor symmetry using 40 N equals four fields on a half uh, on a half space. So the coupling of the ambient CFT to the defect fields comes about by gauging the 3D flavor symmetry. In pictures, in, in sort of schematic formulas, we can write the BCFT partition function as an integral over the three-dimensional CFT partition function, this genuine 3D CFT. We have the flavor symmetry, so there's a conserved current associated with it, which is sourced by a 3D background gauge field. And that is what's highlighted here as argument of the 3D partition function. And then we integrate over this background gauge field weighted by the action for 40 n equals four super young males, where the three-dimensional gauge field arises as boundary value of this four-dimensional gauge field. So this is a very pre precise definition of how does the coupling between the defect fields and the bath work um, in these models. And we can now go on and based on that, um, construct our intermediate holographic picture. The idea is we just geometrize only the three-dimensional degrees of freedom. 
Fortunately, this can be done using the same class of solutions I already discussed, ADS4 and two spheres warped over Riemann surface. Uh, we can compare how this three-dimensional solution will uh, match up against the BCFT dual. We still have our NS5 sources. We still have the strip with the same sort of general warping structure. But instead of having an ADS5 cross S5 emerge on one end of the strip, which was due to the same infinity three brains, the strip now, the geometry now closes off on both ends of the strip. What we get as a trade off is a second set of D5 brain sources. We have ND5 brains here and two NK D5 brains here. So this reshuffles a little bit the arrangement of the brain sources, but qualitatively, we get a very similar um, ADS4 solution, now a genuine ADS4 solution associated with this three dimensional field theory here. And we can now construct our proper intermediate description by just applying uh, first principles ADS-CFT only to the three-dimensional part in the BCFT um, uh, field theory. So this is the formula we started with before. And the idea now is to use the Z equals Z um, version of ADS-CFT and just replace the 3D field theory partition function with the partition function for string theory on this particular background we constructed here. This gives us a concrete construction for the intermediate gravity theory and the coupling to the ambient CFT degrees of freedom naturally arises from our writing of the BCFT partition function. This intermediate dual now is just um, um, constructed um, following the brain construction and is local by construction. So this is really the part we want to have here. So in some way, from the 10 dimensional perspective at this point, I could call it and say, well, we have an intermediate picture and we can be happy, um, but it would be a little more um, um, satisfactory if we can actually go back to the brain world model and put our finger on where the reasoning there went wrong. What was too naive about the brain world model reason? And to get there, we can, um, comp we can in more detail now compare the geometries for this BCFT dual and the three dimensional. Um, dual. What we would need for the naive intermediate picture to work is that the 3D dual can in some way be embedded as part of the full BCFT dual. That is what we did in the bottom up picture. We said we have our BCFT dual, but gravity on the brain is right away the intermediate picture. So what we would need for this to work is that this three-dimensional dual fits somehow into the, um, into the BCFT dual. And that's just not the case. Uh, there are various ways to look at this. Um, one way is to use these, um, these sort of uh, the special nice set of coordinates, which I discussed previously, which had a clear meaning in the brain construction. Uh, we can put those onto both of these solutions. And the idea then is that these curves here get identified. In particular, the far left end of the strip is the deep 3D end of the quiver and is furthest away from any modifications to be made. And we can ask if the geometries actually uh, agree on the left end of the strip, and they just don't. Uh, what you see in this plot here is uh, the ratio for various geometric quantities on the left end of the strip, the Ricci scalar, the radius of the ADS4, in Einstein frame and string frame, and you see that none of those agree for generic values of n over k. The only limit where they agree is the near critical limit. And in that limit, the paradox went away in the first place. So we have only in this particular near critical limit uh, does the 3D dual fit into the uh, full BCFT dual. Uh, for all other values, this is just too simplistic a way to look at it. All right, so we have our, our 10D dual and we uh, can understand sort of how to construct an intermediate picture and how we have to be more careful. Uh, we can now ask how this connects to the page curve discussions. Um, and for those, the crucial point is that for these page curve discussions, all we needed is the existence of a consistent intermediate picture. We use the intermediate uh, level of duality to translate a black hole question into a BCFT question. And that we can do as soon as we have a consistent intermediate picture. The BFT question can then be answered um, using the full BCFT dual as we did. And that stands and the calculations are fine. The claim is 
the intermediate picture is more complicated uh, than one may have thought. But if one did the same calculation in the proper intermediate picture, one would recover the same kind of page curves and the results then. In the bottom up view, um, the intermediate picture as gravity on the end of the world brain is too simplistic. That's okay. Um, the point where one has to be a little careful is with too literal interpretations of this um, naive intermediate picture. For example, in the um, plots of the surfaces I have shown, the island region was extending outside of the black hole horizon. And this is now really a statement in the full BCFT dual. Whether this still holds in the uh, proper intermediate description is something one, uh, one would have to look at and which is just not clear, I would say, at this point. But the point is the calculation stand. And with that, um, let me just um, end with a quick summary. Uh, the main points, sort of take home points, was that we have top down string theory models for 40 black holes coupled to a bath. We uplifted this island and page curve story um, to a string theory setting. We have a proper intermediate description, uh, which refines this uh, notion in these bottom up models and resolves the puzzles which appeared there. Um, one can play similar games for those who may be familiar for weight holography and information transfer with a gravitating bath. For that, I would um, refer to the paper, so just talk to me. Um, and with that, let me thank you for listening. Yes, and thank you very much for this very nice talk. So are there any questions? So let me start with a question. Uh, namely, you said at the very end, second last slide, that of course this page curve um, is not qualitatively changed, but of course it could be quantitatively changed, or and we uh, even would agree. Yeah. So, do so you say the page curve stands? With that, you really mean that? Um, by that, I get... it stands quantitatively. Um, you have to ask sort of. Let me let me phrase this in the tendy, um, in the tendy language where I'm just uh, I can make these things a little sharper. Um, so the the claim is um, here we have an intermediate, a clear idea of what the intermediate picture is. There's the geometric dual of this particular three dimensional field theory. And we can imagine dropping a black hole into, into that and making it talk to 40 n equals four um, on a half space. I wouldn't know how to calculate it at the level of this intermediate holographic description. But what I know how to do is look at the full combined 3D40 system and cal just calculate the page curve in this full BCFT dual. So in some way, we use the intermediate picture to phrase our problem. We want the black hole in ADS coupled to a bath and calculate the uh, radiation entropy. Then we use the intermediate picture to translate this to a proper BCFT question. I have a BCFT. This is a pure field theory question now. I pick a region somewhere away from the defect and I calculate the von Neumann entropy associated with that region. And that is what I can just do in the full in the full BCFT dual. If you believe in ADS-CFT, then you can just do that. Um, and, and in that sense, the calculation really stands. Okay, but you do not assume basically that you are necessarily in some kind of semi-classical limit, like if you uh, translate one picture into the other. There is a sense in which um, both of these field theories are in a, in a large end limit, like in both cases, for example, the number. So what I need in the BCFT dual to be in the regime where I can trust the supergravity approximation is I want a large number of D3 brains poking out here. Yes. And at the same time, I want a large number of NS5 brains and D5 brains. This is um, sort of, one needs to make sure 
in sort of geometric terms that these singular points where the grain sources emerge don't sort of spoil, uh, don't contribute substantially to the calculations and those kinds of things. And altogether, they they are they are satisfied if we have large numbers of D5s and D5 and NS5 grains here. That is the way these sort of three-dimensional long quiver theories come about. And on the right-hand side, these numbers are all still large, um, if that makes sense. So the number of NS5 grains doesn't change. The number of D5 grains doesn't change. Large number of D5 grains over here. So in that sense, this is this is still sort of a, a large geometry, a large semi-classical geometry, which is which is popping out here. Okay, are there further questions? So um, let me also ask another one. So now, given that you have now a um, top-down construction. Um, can you predict, like from this top-down construction, really the precise value, like from from like in CF, CFT perspective, like the the value of your uh, page curve, like uh, at later this times? Great, yeah. This is this is a great point. Um, I I would love to do that. Um, so I've shown you these pictures here where there is some phase diagram of where I get a page curve and where I get a constant entropy. Um, and there is, okay, so let me take it one step at a time. In principle, these are CFT questions now. And it would be fantastic to reproduce them um, using actual CFT machinery. That, that, that would be really great. Um, in terms of how hard that is, we're talking about calculating some um, entanglement entropies and mixed 3D, 4D systems, strongly interacting, this and that. Um, th that that might, you know, how feasible that is is a different question. But at a conceptual level, yes, these are statements now about calculations in field theories. So this is one of the main reasons for 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 doing this exercise um, is to really have in field theory, aside, technical complications aside, of course, we, we, we know in principle how to do things. Um, and it would be great to reproduce um, um, these uh, calculations somehow from field theory. There is actually a question which is um, a step below that and perhaps easier to address. There is um, at zero temperature without black hole, just the BCFT. Um, I don't think I have a slide on that, but there is a kind of phase transition where um, so if you just take vacuum ADS, no black hole, um, you can still have an analog of the surfaces going through the horizon and the island surfaces, just whether they end on the brain or just hang straight down from the bottom up perspective. And depending on these N and K parameters, uh, the island surface either exists or doesn't exist. It's not needed without a black hole because uh, the entropy doesn't grow. There's no information paradox, but there is still a qualitative change depending on whether these island surfaces are there or not. And that would, for example, be something which should in principle be tractable um, uh, using field theory methods. So I, I suppose what I'm saying is, yes, it would, it would be nice to, to develop the field theory picture here. Um, you can also take perhaps inspiration from the form of these um, of these field theories. We have some long quiver 3D, some long three-dimensional quiver theory coupled to eventually to a 4D gauge node. Perhaps one can cook up similar models in lower dimensions, which have the same qualitative feature. Some long quiver theory, perhaps even long quiver quantum mechanics coupled to a gauge node of one dimension higher uh, on a half space and see if just qualitatively similar features can be reproduced in that way using field theory methods. Okay, thanks. So are there further questions? That seems to be not the case. Then thank you again for this really nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank, thank you for having me. Um, I stop now recording so people can still ask questions in private. <laughs>